In the history of elite chess grandmaster tournaments, there have been few streaks of absolute dominance. In the early days, Wilhelm Steinitz famously defeated like 25 people in a row, but that was like the 19th century. Then of course, Bobby Fischer had his famous 11 out of 11 in the US Championship, and later on, he won 20 games in a row. So in today's video, I'm going to feature the games of Fabiano Caruana, who in 2014 in the Singfield Cup went 7-0 to start the tournament. His opponents were Magnus Carlsen, Hikaru Nakamura, Maxim Vashelagrav, Veselin Topalov, and Levan Ranyan. The format is a double round robin, so there's 10 rounds because you have to play everybody two times. So just do the math. Seven wins, three draws, eight and a half out of 10. Fabiano started the tournament with a 3600 level performance. So we'll kick things off with the first game, who he was playing against uh, Veselin Topalov, who was a former world champion. And Veselin started the game with a symmetrical English, trying to get Fabiano out of his preparation. Big thing of these games is his opening preparation and his ability to adapt. And Topalov plays this move g4, and a few moves later, plays a, a knight jump into Fabiano's territory, kind of maybe trying to reroute the bishop over here. Here, Fabiano adapts to what his opponent is trying to do and completely reverses it onto Veselin. So he makes every right trade. First, he trades the knights, and then he defends the threat of the bishop. When the knight comes to attack the bishop, he gets the bishop out of the way and targets the pawn on b2. Veselin plays queen d2, and now Fabiano realizes that by swapping off all these pieces, and by the way, if you're confused, that is not a free bishop. There would be a knight fork of the king and the queen. He trades the right way. He trades the bishops, and then he trades the knights and activates the queen. He's able to kind of adapt to his opponent, trying to take him out of his comfort zone, and watch as he converts this game. We get bishop f2, and rather than swooping in, you know, it's, even though you're defended, Fabiano might not might not want this simplification because Topalov's got this. Watch what Fabiano does. He switches the play action to the king side, forces the king away, and then plays c4. So rather than taking and threatening a mate, he finds this nice idea c4, getting his pawn out of danger. And if this trade were to happen, he would take back and his rook and bishop would team up on this pawn. So for that reason, Topalov plays queen to c2, and now Fabi gets the rook out of the way and kind of threatens the fact that the bishop might move out of the way in the future and the rook and the queen will team up. Great players play on one side, down the middle, and on the left. Or I guess in this case, the left would be the king side. On the left is not a side of the board. Queen h5. He does not address the pawn, instead lining up the queen and the, and the bishop to threaten a mate. Uh, Topalov really doesn't have much way to stop this, so he plays h4, and now Fabi just goes back. See? He feints the attack, the pawn goes up, and then he just goes right back. Because by doing this, he's made the pawn come forward. The pawn cannot go back, whereas the queen could shuffle, and that's it. I mean, we have queen d3 stopping queen h3, but now we see that idea trying to deflect the queen again. And Fabiano finish this, finishes this in style with the move bishop to b2. Why is this so strong? It covers the c1 square, and you've laid the red carpet for your pawn. Topalov resigned here. Just completely lost position for white. Even if you try to get this to an endgame, I just push, and you can't stop my pawn. So a nice win for Fabiano, and he begins his campaign just like that. Let's go to game number two. So his next opponent is Maxime Vachet Le Graf, who is a Frenchman, uh, the best player in France. And this game is an example of Fabiano's opening preparation. MVL plays c6, the Karo Khan, and we get the most challenging variation objectively at the top level, which is the advance. Bishop f5, and now white plays knight f3 and bishop e2, variation named after Nigel Short, literally called the short variation. There's a few ways to play this position with black. Nowadays, the grandmasters are maneuvering more, but here, MVL plays c5, immediately striking back in the center. The problem is that white can play bishop to e3, and has a lead in development, is pressuring to take your pawn, and if you just kind of like allow white to get faster play, white gets a very pleasant position. So MVL played a move here, queen b6. Very aggressive move. And Fabiano says, okay, come and get my pawn, buddy. You want it? Come take it. MVL doesn't for a second, plays knight c6, and now he takes. So back then, um, this had been all seen before. And throughout this video, I'm going to introduce something to all of you called novelty. And basically, that's the first move of the game, which is new. So Fabiano plays queen e1, defending his knight. cd4 by MVL. Bishop takes back. We get takes, takes, bishop before. All seen before. All seen before. The knight is hit, right? Queen is hitting. There's a pin here. So what does white do here? Plays knight db5. 
with the idea to kind of jump in and in and also defend the knight. All right, we get bishop back to a5, covering knight c7, allowing knight d6. Fabiano here plays rook b1, asking the queen where it's going to go. The only thing it can do is take. And at this point in history, everybody had played rook to b3. With the idea of kind of boxing in the queen and adding another layer of protection to this knight before deciding what to do next. Like trying to get in here to, you know, so that your knight at least has some guard. But Fabiano plays a novelty. He plays rook c1, which makes the queen move. And here he plays g4, which had never been seen before. This is, this is, a, this is a brand new situation, right? So now we have to get bishop back to g6 and Fabiano just goes for it. Like his prep was literally just force the queen to this ugly square, leave all of this as a potential infiltration, and just go punish your opponent. The thing about preparation is that oftentimes your opponents have to follow the best moves or else they're going to get in serious trouble. So MVL played bishop e4, which so far so good. You know, you don't want to get trapped. And Fabi plays rook f2. And now it's like, wait a second, where's this queen going? <laughs> this queen, it's, the queen's very uncomfortable. I mean, is it really going to try to get out like this? So we get knight to h6. And I think this was the first move out of the preparation of Fabiano. Up to this point, he knew all the best moves. So what do Grandmasters do? They have to adapt to the situation on the board. And he finds the best move. He calculates and he plays bishop to d3, showcasing why you put your rook here. But this isn't over. I mean, this isn't somehow winning, of course. Black just moves back. But we get rook b1. And rather than taking, you play one more rook move, kicking the queen out once again back to c5. And now you take, in the face of danger of your queen, you hit this queen right back, we get takes, and now takes, and castles. And you say, why didn't he take? Well, he didn't take, because knight d6 check. Comes with check, and you lose your queen. So after the dust settles, Fabiano is just up a bishop. He has a bishop, his opponent doesn't have a bishop. But his opponent has two pawns. So okay, it's a little bit complicated still. e3 hitting the rook, rook comes back to f1, Rook c8, and Fabiano just brings everybody back. That's the thing about the top level. You gotta use your prep to get to that point and then convert the game. And he does that. I mean, he just plays very solidly, a couple of solid moves, making sure everything's accounted for. No infiltration on the second rank. That's why he played this move, to stop the rook coming in or the queen coming into the second rank. Everybody guards everybody. A little bit of a simplification. He picks up that pawn. Now it's bishop for one pawn. And uh, knight f7 and knight comes back to c3. If you take, 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 I take b7, I just have an extra bishop. And so, for that reason, after knight c3, MVL resigned. He made it look easy. He made it look easy. Fabiano kind of uh, shows this new idea, makes it very difficult, and then just goes wild, pushes these pawns, and MVL's mistake was playing knight to h6. Uh, he apparently had to evacuate fast, immediately, or else it was going to be bad news. Um, and computer here also gives a move king f8, but my web browser computer is not as strong as whatever Fabiano's preparing with. So he came prepared with a new idea, 2-0, and oh, let's keep it moving. Now in game number three, he's playing Magnus Carlsen at this point rated 2877. This was Magnus Carlsen's, one of his highest ratings of all time. Magnus was like 2881, officially 2889, unofficially, so crazy. And back then they had not played a world championship match, so... Magnus plays the, it uh, kind of looks like the Italian, but it's called the Bishop's Opening. And here is another example of Fabiano's preparation. This is actually fascinating. Listen up. So the players kind of play this main line position. The design is that black has not played knight c6, so you can play d5. And uh, this is all theory. You can't take this pawn because white would play knight g5 attacking, kind of like in fried liver style, right? Bishop's Opening is pretty tricky. Now, Fabi plays bishop b4 to force this move and then come back. So that's already the first kind of wrinkle in the position. You can just play bishop d6, but then your opponent would be able to play knight c3 later, so you force the pawn there, and then you come back. And this waste of time doesn't actually change the position too much. The bishop pins the knight to the queen. Fabi takes to kind of clarify what's going on in the center, attacks the bishop, and Magnus goes back. We have queen to e7. He's, do he's doing this because he wants to get out of the way of the, of the queen here. Maybe bishop e6 in the future to trade, tr drop out with his knight, Notice that he doesn't castle, right? He plays queen e7 first, knight d2, knight d7, and um, bishop g3, bishop c7, and castles. Now, at this point, the only other game in the database is a game where Rustam Kazimjanov, very strong grandmaster, world champion contender back in the day, uh, 
was playing with the black pieces. Now, at that point, this, the game ended in a draw here. Here, in this position after black plays knight h5. You know who Rustam Kazimjanov is? He's on the team of Fabiano Caruana. So, Rustam and Fabiano, they work together. So, you see the idea being used now. So, he plays knight h5. h3. Very instigating. Whoa, why would he... Okay, so now the rook is open. But we get knight c... Wait a second, why isn't Fabi castling? This is bait. This move is bait. Because he wants the bishop. Fabiano wants the two bishops versus the two knights, and he wants an advantage. He, he makes Magnus Carlsen sacrifice. Well, he doesn't make him sacrifice, but it looks damn good. Because now, anywhere you move the knight, it's a double check. Who would turn down a double check? Now, Fabi has to go king g8. Looks like white has something. He's got big attack. But even with all this, with the queen and the knight kind of coming in, and rook f8, oh my god, it looks terrifying. When the dust settles, it's actually Fabiano who's got a better position. Magnus Carlsen is up four points of material here. But his pieces are paralyzed. I mean, they're, they went in. But actually, all, all of a sudden, look at this move. Attacking the rook, hitting the queen. Magnus plays queen f1. Because if you take, then I'm going to take, 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 and bye-bye. Also, you have triple pawns. So queen f1 by Magnus. If Fabi plays knight d3, look at that move. That, that could just be taken. He could just take it. If you take it, you lose the guard of the rook. And that's what happens. And I say, well, 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 why not just take the rook first? Why not take the rook first? Check. And now the f2 square is covered by that knight, so you can't block with the queen. And if king h2, I check and I mate you. If king h1, I mate you with knight f2, I win a lot of your material. So Magnus, with this knight just jumping in, has to take it. Rook f8, knight is still trapped. And now, again, he delays recapturing the knight. <laughs> That's not going anywhere, right? So Magnus plays knight f3. Queen takes you. He's still delaying recapturing. e5, now he takes. Now when the dust, ultimately, all of the dust settles. I've said that multiple times. Material is equal, but it's Magnus Carlsen who's going to maybe lose this pawn and ultimately maybe lose the game to his king. And that's kind of exactly what happens. I mean, he, he hunts down the pawn. He wants check also on the king. Queen to d6. Rook d8 attacking the queen. Magnus drops back. Fabi chases the queen down. Hides the king. e7. But the problem is that white is too passive. And here Magnus Carlsen just blundered. Rook d1. And maybe he thought that uh, he, he had something. Uh, but here, you know, queen h2 was necessary. But ultimately, uh, he plays knight h2, rook d1. And... Uh, we get queen g1, and he resigns because anywhere the king goes, it's a check, and you lose your pawn. And again, Fabiano made it look easy. He made it look easy against Magnus Carlsen when Magnus Carlsen was rated 28.77. Nice opening idea. His coach's preparation, or his, you know, teammate, his preparation. 3-0. Now, this game was also impressive. He's got the white pieces, and he's playing Levon Ragnan, who back in the day is 28.05. Levon has one of the highest ratings of all time. Not at this moment, but in his career, like 28.30, fifth or sixth highest rating of all time. This one was something we see a lot nowadays, and this one is impressive because Levon always plays E4, E5. He plays the Rui Lopez all the time. Now, in the Rui, normally white is trying to expand with c3 and d4. This is just classical Rui Lopez. It's the way, um, that's actually not how you pronounce it. It's how I've been pronouncing it my whole life, but um, it's, it's, uh, it's Rui Lopez. It's not Rui Lopez, it's Rui Lopez. So he plays d3 and, a th and knight c3 and a3. This setup with d3, a3, knight c3 is, was, in 2014 was not very popular at all. Now it's very trendy. It's a new way to play. And basically, you, you fight for d5 with pieces. And then you try to play bishop g5 and maybe take. And you get like a positional approach. Nowadays, it's quite well known that bishop g4 is completely fine for black. But Levon plays this, which back in the day had been seen, all the way kind of up until this moment right around here. When after queen to d6, Fabiano plays knight a2. What? So Fabiano again introduces a novelty. Uh, and the point is like, what the heck is the, what is this? Now, if you plug this into engine, zero, zero, zero. It's equal, Gotham, you idiot. Why are you showing the viewers this? It's equal. Here's the idea. Very tough for black to make a move. Like in the game, Levon at some point played D4. He shut down the center. But what this does is it creates a terrible positional weakness. If this D pawn ever trades, this, these are doubled isolated frozen pawns. Okay, that's very bad. And now we see the other idea of Fabiano's preparation. Look at this. His idea is to put the rooks there, move the queen out of the way, and rotate the knight to control the queen side. 
So he plays knight c1 and knight b3. And black can't really move, like, at all. Now he plays rook c1. It's like, wait a second, is this dude about to play c3? No. He's going to the other side of the board. Just the constant threat of it happening. Look at that. The constant threat of the advancement of the, of the opening of this file is enough to keep black confused. And this knight can't move because you'll jump in here with the knight. So Levon has to respond with h6, knight back to f3. Targeting this. Not threatening to take it. And now we get rook f1. So this rook is doing some dances. But the idea, you want to move the knight again. And, you know, f2 was going to be a problem. Rook f7. But because he got Levon to overcommit so early with his pawns, Levon killed his pawn play. So now the queen side and the center is completely locked. That was the point of this entire idea. And now Fabiano switches the play, just like he did in the Topalov game. He completely rotates the rooks to the other side because there's nothing Levon can do. And Levon is at the mercy of the kingside onslaught. So g6, queen back, queen back to g3. You say, what's so impressive about this? Well, here Levon gets hit with knight a5. And in trying to defend his king, realizes the e-pawn doesn't really have a good guard. Fabiano can take this and this and this. And uh, instead of going for the rook, he actually just sacrifices a piece for two pawns, forces the queen to move. And look at this. Look at what he does. I mean, he just makes it look so simple. Knight is going to come back and take this, or you just move the queen and trap the, the rook with a pawn. He sacks the piece ultimately because Lavon's. What's this knight doing? That horse has wandered off onto the highway somewhere. It's just gone. Right? So, C5, Levon's trying to <laughs> do what you want over there, Levon. I don't, I don't really care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, Levon. All right. Now I take. Now I bring in my queen. And now G4 is coming. And this game took a little bit of time to convert. But he just bulldozes. Just that he, he basically made it seem like Levon was playing without two pieces. Like, that's how dominant the queenside uh, bind became. And he just marches down the board. Just all the way down. Just finally the knight comes back into play. And they make one more move. And, and then they never made another move. And here the game is just over because even though Levon can prevent the pawn from promoting, I just check you and then I just go and get the knight. And even if this knight could magically become a rook or a queen and just go here and guard, then I just push my pawns. And you just, you just, I mean, like, that's, there's three games in a row that he just made it look so simple. Against guys who are 2,800. That's 4-0. and Let's go to game number five. So this game is against Hikaru, and Hikaru at this point sees the locomotive, right? He's like, all right, I'm playing with the white pieces. We're looking at it from Fabiano's perspective because it's a video featuring him. But what Hikaru does is he plays into a Slav defense, and he plays knight d2. What's the idea of knight d2? Well, it's to get Fabiano out of preparation, and he does that. He plays knight h4, which actually is a popular move here, um, as weird as this looks. And they get a very non-standard structure out of, the, out of the beginning of the game. So already no games in the database. You can see that Hikaru came with the intention to get Fabiano out of his preparation. So now in this game, we kind of have to see how does Fabiano adjust to the change in the fact that he has no real advantage from the opening. The problem is that when you take a guy out of his prep, number one, you can take yourself out of prep because you're not comfortable in those positions. And number two, sometimes to get someone out of prep, you got to play something that's not great and very risky. It's risky for both parties. So Fabiano doesn't have the bishop pair, Hikaru does, but in these positions, if black gets a very solid bind, it could be very tough to break. So Fabi plays e5. Not some maneuvering move, not castles, but intends to punish immediately with e5. We get castles by white, castles by black, queen b3, and queen c8. You could argue here that queen b6 is playable to try to trade the queens, Fabi not interested. Because it's really difficult for white to develop. So Hikaru drops the knight back and wants to play bishop d2. Now we take take, and knight back to b8. <laughs> Whatever you do, I could do better, right? So bishop e3, queen d7. Very solid structure. Everything looks good. White is happy. Kind of got the position that he wanted from the opening. Uh, both rooks come to the middle. It's kind of normal. And now Fabiano plays knight e8 with a couple of ideas behind this move. Well, first of all, you know, maybe he wants to rotate the knight and target the center like that. He also might want to play bishop to f6. Um, it's a relatively closed position. I mean, there are some openings, but it's, it's relatively closed, which allows you this kind of ability to maneuver. All of that is now happening. And then here is the, the kind of the most impressive moment of the game. Fabiano pushes a pawn one square. Now, I'm not saying that it's impressive because he pushed this pawn. I'm saying it's impressive because with one move, 
he made it significantly harder for white to improve his position. For example, if black plays the move a6 here, white is gonna play f4, dominate this side, and bishop g2 will just line up into this and no one's getting in the way of that bishop. Bambiano sees that that is coming. So he plays g5. It's all about these moments in these games, these small moments, right? So b4 and now g6. He kind of re-solidifies wh wh whatever was missing, moves his king up one square and says, hey, you know, maybe in the future I've got my own aggressive intentions coming. But he's so impenetrable here. He's so solid. And now Hikaru plays b5, knight back to e7, and there is a bit of a concern with the overextension here, maybe. Bishop e3, knight e6. It's just, it's like, how do you... How do you break this guy? I mean, he's playing so well. Coordinating his pieces really well, long-term planning without killing the short-term flexibility of the position. After takes, takes, we have this structure, but because all these pawns are on light squares versus all these pawns on dark squares, this bishop is not happy. And black is happy, and Fabiano, look at that, snuffed that out, right? And now he plays rook c4, and you can't really take on f5 because knight d4 comes, and if you check, if you take here, I'm gonna check you and take back and I'm bulldozing you down the center of the board. I'm just, I mean, you all, everything opens up in my favor. So Kikaro plays 92 and now he's on the defensive and um, well, Fabiano, and you know, he tries to create a little bit of counterplay here, but Fabi takes the queenside pawn, which overextended earlier, immediately punishing his opponent's kind of, like I said, overextension, brings it back and just slow improvement. Sacrifices the queen for the two rooks. It's a borderline sacrifice, right? Even a flashy conversion here. Queen for two rooks is normally equal, but not in this case, because black controls the only open area. And even here, you know, calls kind of this bluff, and rook c2 comes, and this looks actually a little bit scary. To Kikaru's credit, he did create some very nice counterplay here with this queen h7, but after king e8, f5, like he's trying to go all in, bishop d4, th th there, is, there is actually nothing. So queen g6, king d8, the only move... So that if this pawn is taken, it's not checked. Very important. This stays pinned. Takes. Here, and you say, well, why didn't you just keep checking him? Well, yeah, I mean, he would have ran his king away. You can't check because you're pinned. And the king just hides and the game is over. So, you know, we get queen e6 and the rooks come in, attack. And even this, at very late stage of the game, he finds this way to just consolidate all his pieces. And um, on move 67, Hikaru resigned because... The king is completely safe, and the pawns are going. And there's just nothing. I mean, f7, you just take. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, it was a, it was a longer game, um, but the most impressive part of this game was adapting to the opening, clearly being, uh, you know, deliberately taken out of your comfort zone, and just playing solid chess, trading at the right moments, maneuvering in the right ways, being solid, coming up with this idea g5 g6 king g7 all up on the g file and um i mean what to say even when he's not in his opening he's still able to win 5-0 and oh. so now that fabiano has confidently defeated every single participant once it's time to go again he's got the white pieces he plays veselin topolov and we have a taimanov open sicilian with the move a6 more popular is queen to c7 but okay we have a6 mainline stuff takes takes Making black kind of block in this bishop and ultimately the position from the main line opening is one where uh, the light squared bishop is a li little bit little bit cramped, but nothing that chess theory hasn't seen before. Knight f6, Fabiano goes to challenge his opponent in the main line with this move e5. Knight goes back to d7. We have queen to g4, hitting the uh, pawn on g7. And here black has a decision. Do you play g6 or king to f8? Topalov plays king f8, so now, I mean, maybe like 40% of overall games. I think g6 is more popular, unless I'm mistaken. Uh, and knight a4. So knight a4 uh, is a, it, it again takes the game even further down into the rabbit hole. Uh, and here, really, Topalov plays a move that is shocking. Queen a5. Um, attacking the rook, threatening mate. Uh, it doesn't look so shocking on the surface, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's like buried, I think, quite deep, maybe like. I, I, I checked the database before I was making the video, but uh, this move is, like, astoundingly rare, it seems. But even here, Fabiano, playing the move rook e2, adapts to the situation. Gets the rook out of the way. Now Topalov plays the whole idea. h5, punishing the setup of where the queen is. Okay, queen f4. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> getting, a little, uh, getting a little aggressive there, are we? Wow. Well, here, Fabiano has a nice little idea. Bishop d2. 
You attack my queen, I attack your queen. You can't take my knight, by the way, because the queen is always guarding it, wherever it's standing. So we get a queen back, and queen gets out this way as well. Really, white's entire asset is e5. This pawn is a thorn for black. It takes away some very important squares, and even if it clears out by a trade, it opens up my rook. It's not going to get any easier for black. So black needs to counterbalance this with this pawn attack. Like, Topolov isn't tilting and playing some, some weird stuff. This is actually one of the best ways for black to handle the position. And now Topolov plays rook g8. Here Fabiano brings the only piece that's not yet playing into the game and solidifies this square on e5, ready for kind of his next plan. Topolov plays c5. The idea to maybe play c4, isolating this bishop, so Fabiano responds with c4 of his own, right? Takes, takes, bishop b7, and now a useful move h3. This move is useful because it freezes the structure completely. Now the queen can move and this pawn can infiltrate, and just for the future, king has a luft, so it'll never get checkmated. Black activates his only rook, bishop c3, and now goes knight b8, kind of rerouting, activates the rook, knight wants to come here, and we get rook e3. The idea of rook e3 is that Fabiano wants to show his opponent that he knows that rooks move up one square. In reality, there are a few ideas. For the future, maybe you want to leave this as an option. Also, I understand the bishop is there, I'm just saying for the future. You might also just want to trade rooks. Like, or rook d1, for example, and trade like this. But it's just a flexible move, it's a waiting move, it's kind of seeing what black is going to do. And black plays knight to c6, and Fabiano here detonates... Bishop takes e6. Prep and finding the clutch moments where they're there. Sacrificing a bishop to give this check. Now we see the idea. He anticipated knight c6 so that he could sacrifice and go here. King e8. Now queen takes pawn. And black can't do anything. Black is threatened with, with the rook and a check here. And black just has no moves. Rook g7. Queen h6. Who's guarding this rook? Knight d4, trying to counterattack. Bishop comes in, knight comes in, attacking the rook. e6, look at this move. Not even taking. Locking in the king from escaping. You can take my rook with check. I don't care. Pawn takes. I'm down what looks like a full rook right now. And you can't defend yourself. Bishop back to f8. Check. King e7. And now I'll take. Because if you take back, I have check. King moves out to d6, and I push. You got nothing. I'm going to take this. I'm going to mate you. Queen e6 is mating one move. And uh, that's why Topalov resigned after bishop takes g7. Fabiano had good prep, got a good position, and sacrificed the bishop and absolutely tore his opponent to shreds. Seems to be the theme of the video, no? Let's take a look at the seventh game. So in the seventh game, Maxime Vachelagrav, with the white pieces, took Fabi on a little bit of a of a weird kind of twist in the Queen's Gambit decline. Normally, just like Hikaru tried to do, he's trying to get him out of, you know, any sort of preparation by not developing the Knight or the Bishop, actually really finishing the Queen side development. Fabiano came prepared, immediately instigating with his Knight in the center of the board, and after Bishop d3, he plays this move, f5. And he, he creates kind of what's known as a stonewall structure, saying, all right, man, good luck getting rid of my horsey. We get knight to f3 from white, c6, that structure is now complete, and MVL jumps in because he wants to dominate the dark squares. Knight takes, bishop takes, bishop f6. Let's trade bishops. We get takes, takes, now knight back to e2. Fabiano says, all right, e5. You want to continue to delay castling? I'm going to start bashing you in the center of the board. What am I doing? I'm going to start bashing you in the center of the board. So we get queen out to a4. Fabi's like, bro, you good? You good? Like, what? What what's going on over here, man? MVL plays this and finally says, okay. Maxime, what are you doing? Like, I'm gonna I'm you sure you wanna play this game, Maxime? Rook F1? Okay. Knight to G5. Hello. You say, what is Maxime doing? I'm I'm not gonna lie to you. I don't know. I don't really know. I mean sometimes it could be that your opponent is 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 playing this well, so you'd really try to take them out of their zone, but this ain't the way to do it, and Fabi just takes the pawn because it's free, and then Fabi just backs up, you know, uh, he's got ideas maybe to take in the future, maybe bring the queen back to stop the infiltration of this queen, takes, it's exactly what he does, takes on e5, and it's just a clean pawn up, clean pawn up, and white's king is on c3, now b6 comes, shattering everything, 
You say, well, what's so good about that? I just take, yes, c5. I wasn't going to take back and lose my rook. That's why he brought his queen back. This whole idea to bring the queen back was that in the future, he'll be able to play c5. And then he'll play bishop b7, defending his rook, threatening to take the pawn. Now comes d4 check, and hello. How easy does this man make it look? He just completely chops down everything. Now watch what he does to MVL's king. Check. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come closer. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. Come closer. Don't be scared. Like here, MVL kind of, it's kind of funny. Like if you, if you take, it looks a little bit scary, but it's not. He gives a check. He gives one more check. And he, he does this so that he can actually make the 40th move. So in this position, um, it's move 38. And on move 40, they gain the extra time. So he gave a couple of checks. And there's, I mean, there's really no reason not to because then on move 40 you get your 30 minutes and you'll just figure out how to win this position probably by taking this looks scary at first glance it's like oh my god it's gonna no just check here and check and it's over and and i mean fabiano is just seven and oh that's how he did it seven and oh he drew his next three games but if you stick around until this moment i would like to reward you thanks for sticking around you're amazing love you very much in the eighth game of this tournament, he was playing Magnus again. And the game was an accelerated dragon that led to this position. And here, Fabiano Caruana, when you're 7-0, and you run hot, what are you going to do? You're going to go attack. You're going to go attack the world champion. And then you're going to play G4. He just took the fight to Magnus. And Magnus created chaos. Sometimes when you're under pressure, the best thing to do is to create chaos. Just... Try to attack your opponent from all angles. Make them make the critical decisions. And here, you know, Fabi took, took, opened up the lines to the king. It was a very wild game. There was a very legitimate chance for him to be 8-0 with two wins over Magnus Carlsen. Knight a5. And uh, the thing that, that Magnus did very well, he shut down the center. And he was able to kind of safeguard his king. So knight a4, takes, takes, castles. And, you know, the position here is very much in the balance. But... He didn't have to really, like, th there were moments that, that Fabiano could have taken a bit more risk to kind of bring the pieces over this way. But the biggest moment came on move 29, when in this position, you know, Magnus brought back his knight and had pressure here. He's not actually threatening to take, which is why Fabiano played this move, because if takes, there is check, right? There is check. But Magnus played king h8, and since he never took this pawn, the h-file never opened. So his king is safe, and actually black is okay. Black is going to play rook g8 in the future, and black is going to be fine. Which forced a mass simplification and led to an endgame, which ultimately was a draw. Fabiano in this position had a moment. He could have played uh, rook, s rook fd1, targeting the pawn. And for example, if black plays bishop to e7, there's this amazing resource. Takes, takes, check check and you win the queen and if magnus had played this then fabi gets what he wants he wants to lose that pawn because then he can switch the play over to rook g1 like king h8 and play something i don't know like rook g2 even just double up the rooks and go like this and just laser beam magnus down these open files so this was the one moment where he played rook d1 and he had a move here he could have actually started this tournament with eight straight wins and two of them over magnus rated 2877 so one of the greatest winning streaks of all time, as far as I'm concerned. As I said in the introduction, um, I understand Fisher won 20 games. 12 of them were against two guys, okay? And the truth is that with modern day preparation and the extent at which these players review all of their lines, winning seven straight in classical chess is unheard of, especially against the best guys in the world. A lot of these guys rated 2770 and up. So Fabiano Caruana absolutely torched the field. Uh, and as we know, you know, 2014 is some time ago. So he's been very clearly the second best classical chess player in the world. Uh, what more to say? And as the candidates are coming up, it's currently March 2021. The candidates will resume in April 2021. Well, we'll see if he can win that title again or win the uh, tournament again and challenge Magnus Carlsen. But let me know your thoughts. And as always, let me know if there's a concept or a video that I haven't covered. I will happily cover it uh, in future content. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. And I will see you in the next video.